Hello, good afternoon. Hey, Judy. Could everyone take your seats, please? Good to see so many, so many familiar faces here, so many friends. So this is the ninth time that we've run this forum in connection with the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Um, how many of you have been here nine times? Yeah, some, yeah, some of you, Judy, Michelle, Liz, I'm loving it. Uh, Stuart, there we go. All right, my name is Rich LaRochelle. I'm the chair of the Cooperative Development Foundation. And Leslie Mead is over here somewhere. She's the one who does all the work, she and her staff. <laughs> we just stand up here and say what she gives us to say. So before I get started, though, I want to say a few words about the work of the Cooperative Devel Development Foundation and what we do to develop and promote cooperatives. We do it through programmatic work. We do it through grants. We do it through honoring co-op heroes like we're going to do tonight at the Hall of Fame. With regard to pro programmatic work, much of our work recently has been around home health care co-op development. Um, and we featured that topic at some of our conferences in the last couple years. Uh, these are worker co-ops that make a difference in the lives of people day in and day out, bringing home care, um, home care to people in need. Um, on the grant making side, we, um, uh, we make grants through both our operating revenues and through designated funds. These funds include the Howard, Bow Howard Bowers Fund for food co-ops and our newest fund, the Cooperative Education Fund, which came as a result of uh, grant money coming in through the Cooperative Foundation. We are also, um, oops, trying to go forward here. Oh, there we go, whoops. Okay, uh, little problems here. Let's go back a slide. So we're also involved in um, helping uh, cooperatives in the case of disaster recovery. And um, we have uh, been involved particularly in Puerto Rico, making uh, over $180,000 in grants available to the island in 2018. But we provide this service to other cooperative organizations like NRECA, uh, NCG, and others. And we also recognize significant career accomplishment through the induction in the Co-op Hall of Fame. And looking out at the audience, I see several people here who are part of that, um, who have who've been honored in that way. Um, so a year ago, we received a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we've used that grant to do research to measure um, the impact of cooperatives on their communities. So the program today will highlight the first two products of that work, um, again, centered around highlighting and measuring how co-ops have a positive impact on their communities. Our first speaker is Brent uh, Thedos. He's a co-author of the ABCs of Cooperative Impact, the seven-factor impact measure developed by the Urban Institute. Brent will be followed by Margaret Lund, um, whose research applied the impact framework in looking at six cooperative sectors. So let me turn this over to Brett. Thanks very much. Uh, excited to be with you all today uh, and look forward to a good dialogue. This has been a fun partnership with Leslie and Doug and uh, I learned a lot and I uh, hope that we made a contribution. Um, and it's also been fun to partner with Margaret as she's been able to dig into some of the examples and put, put meat on these bones. So thanks, good to be with you. Okay, you've got the publication. So everything I say you can just capture in words, but uh, <clears throat> let me jump in. So what were we trying to do? Uh, we were trying um, to understand how co-ops contribute in participation, in growth, in stability, in sustainability, in equity. And how would we measure that sort of activity across such a broad and diverse group of actors? What 
is the unifying theme when we're trying to message about the impact, the efficacy of this sector. How, how do we do that? That's the challenge that we signed up to undertake. So specifically in terms of a task, we are creating a streamlined, unified framework uh, for metrics and measurement across different cooperative types. And we included both outputs, that's the things you're immediately having doing, as well as outcomes, the, the broader effect of those things over time. We looked at uh, immediate participants, and we also wanted to understand the communities that they're nested in. We focused on how co-ops could build equitable, healthy, and sustainable communities. That was the frame or the lens that we were bringing to this work. For approach, we reviewed the literature, uh, and there is a, a literature, uh, more so for some co-op sectors than for others. Um, we talked to a bunch of you, including some people in this room, uh, so thank you. And uh, at co-ops themselves and representatives or associations. And then we had a draft framework session um, where we got torn apart, I mean where we got constructive <laughs> criticism uh, and came out with a revised version. Okay, so let's get into the actual substance. So here are our ABCs. We actually didn't seek out to make a cute series of letters. Um, it just actually unfolded that way. Uh, so we thought we would take advantage of it to help people remember. So A is about access. And I'll get into the definition of each of these in a minute. B is about business sustainability. C is about community. D is about democratic governance and empowerment. E is about equity, diversity, and inclusion. F is about financial security and advancement for workers. And G is about growth. OK, so let's dig into these with a little bit more detail. We're defining access as where the process whereby a cooperative can increase access to affordable quality products, services, supplies, and markets can lower costs, and uh, especially uh, do so in communities seen, seen as higher risk or underserved. So we hope that this concept of access resonates across the different types of cooperatives that you're active in. And obviously the specific exact metric of how that's going to look is going to be somewhat different. Um, but what we are hoping to articulate in advance is that co-ops of every shade and color and stripe can measure access and how they're increasing access for their communities that they're targeted on. So let me help put a little bit of um, example to how that could look. And so what we have in the paper that you all have is a look at how this might play out for some industry sectors more than others uh, and how it would play out differently. So these are groupings of different types of credit unions. We've got the consumer ones, um, excuse me, different types of co-ops. We've got the consumer ones. And so all of the details are in the paper, but I just wanted to lift up a couple for credit unions. So how could Carla measure access for her credit union? Uh, how could you do that? Uh, well, we think there's a couple key ways that that could happen. Uh, have you had an effect on expanding account and product availability in the communities and with the populations that you're trying to serve? Do you have or do you bring more flexible underwriting standards than do other financial institutions? Do you have lower rates uh, or fees? Rates, uh, you want lower rates on borrow, maybe you want higher rates paid out on savings. Do you have more personalized customer service? Do you have decreased, uh, can you show a decreased use of high cost alternative financial services like payday lending? And can you ultimately point to improve financial health for your consumers? So these are ways that credit unions can measure access. So we've got some uh, conceptual ways to articulate how that could be measured for different types of co-ops there. So let's turn to B, business sustainability. A cooperative business structure can increase firm survival and profitability through higher and less volatile revenues, lower costs, 
and focus on long-term outcomes, including scaling the cooperative to compete with multinationals. So how would you measure business sustainability for the co-op? So for this one, we wanted to lift up the example from farmer independent small business co-ops, particularly focused on marketing, processing, and purchasing. So how would you measure business sustainability, RB? You can look at improved marketing and distribution, increased productivity of the firms and production, lower costs, at providing, facilitating lower costs for supplies and services, increased market share, improved profitability, decreased revenue volatility, increased firm survival, ultimately. Community commitment. A community-focused cooperative is committed to being a good neighbor through education, financial support, facility use, environmentally sound business practices. You're gonna hear some neat examples of these. So we thought this was a cross-cutting theme that uh, communities, uh, that co-ops could measure just that, the extent to which they are providing education supports in their communities, financial supports, uh, volunteer hours, uh, facilities to be used that reflect the values of their community. Democratic governance and empowerment is obviously central to co-ops. Um, and in a well-functioning cooperative then, and this can be measured, cooperatives, uh, a membership actively participates and shapes the mission and decisions of the organization, which translates into broader, uh, this is the moving out, radiating out, broader civic and political involvement for people who are participating in the co-ops. And so it's worth acknowledging at this point, but this is true for all of the indicators, that what we're not saying is inherently all co-ops are good at all of these different things. Um, that's not the point of an indicator. The temperature is a gauge, you know, a thermometer is a gauge of the temperature. It's not saying it's always at this level. And so by looking at these metrics, what you can do uh, in part for your own organizations is begin to understand, well, how are we measuring up? You could even do that to compare among some peer organizations. And you could certainly use that from an advocacy perspective of we're different from these people because of these established metrics that we can demonstrate. Okay, so what does democratic governance look like? Um, it, it, exactly that, we can measure participation and the way that's gonna be actually operationalized is a little bit different than some of the different co-op structures, um, but the broader metric that we're looking for is participation and shaping decision making and empowering broader community. E, equity, diversity, inclusion. To be effective contributor to its community, cooperative membership reflects the community in terms of racial composition, gender, age, abilities, and historically excluded communities and individuals have a voice and they have leadership opportunities. So we think that's again a pretty cross-cutting set of metric that co-ops can seek to measure themselves against. Obviously it looks a little different if we're talking about um, co-ops of other business owners versus co-ops of workers, uh, but the broader uh, lessons still hold. F is financial security and advancement for workers. So co-ops work best for their members, employees, and communities when they provide living wage jobs, benefits, increased opportunities for wealth building, career advancement, training, leadership development, have lower turnover rates, and higher satisfaction. So here's an example of some of the specific metrics that we thought could be looked at. We look at uh, to the extent to which the co-op is providing increased uh, levels of living wage jobs with benefits compared to other um, types of employers. Again, this makes most sense for us in a couple of these categories. We have different examples for some of the others. Uh, where there's an opportunity for wealth building, career advancement, training, leadership development, where you can measure turnover of employees and see the extent that co-ops are uh, different and job satisfaction measures. Okay, this is our last ABC and then I'll have a couple of wrap-up thoughts, which is growth. Uh, so here we're talking about local and regional anchors about promoting economic growth through stable jobs, high industry standards, uh, consistent services, economic multiplier effects, increased community investment, and local procurement. So this example I wanted to lift up food and grocery. 
so we can look at the extent to which food co-ops do local sourcing the extent to which they do local employment and profit sharing, and then how that results in increased community investment. And again, that could be measured for your single co-op over time to see how we're changing against other peer co-ops or against other types of food and grocery uh, distributors and sellers. Okay, so a couple of slides uh, before I turn it to Margaret on how we would apply this framework in the real world words on the page can look nice, but what do we do with them? <coughs> so first, uh, there's a process of brainstorming what data you need to establish these metrics, and how are you going to get from the metric to the actual indicator that you're going to be measuring. Uh, and that starts with some amount of review of uh, existing metrics that are relevant. Then there's the hard part about prioritizing. Often when I work with groups, there's a lot more possibilities than there are abilities to uh, actually see through the data collection needs, the reporting needs over time. So there's some prioritization. Uh, and there's definitely a cost and a benefit uh, calculation to that. The next thing that I would encourage the sector as a whole to think a little more carefully about is counterfactuals. Um, so what is the comparison? What are we telling the story different? And that could just be over time, as I've been talking about, um, but it could be to non-co-op businesses um, that allow you to tell a convincing story about the impact of your organizations. Next is to finalize the set of met set of metrics, uh, including outputs and outcomes. Ideally, that could be causally attributed to you, your effort, but um, at the very least, finalized. And specify a process for completing it, who's getting it, what are the audiences. Pretest, pretest, pretest. Collect and analyze, put the data to use. Uh, so that is a quick overview of some metrics that we are hoping can be um, taken up uh, across different co-op actors uh, and that there can be somewhat of a unified set of uh, reporting and messaging about the impacts of co-ops around these broad categories. Also, of course, acknowledging that the specific indicators are going to depend and differ along the way, um, but looking for a broad theme and umbrella. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Margaret, who is going to uh, really build this out with some real examples. Let me make sure I know how to do this. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks um, so much. So, so my part of this assignment um, was kind of the squishier part, which is sure there's lots of things. You know, there are outputs that you can measure. There's like sales and revenues and this and that and turnover rates and stuff. But I think that all of us that work in the sector know that that some of the most um, real things that happen happen on a personal level or happen amongst people within an organization or, or really just things that you get much more from the stories that somebody would tell you about the difference that a co-op made to them um, or to their families or their community or whatever. So that, you know, from the beginning of this project, it wasn't really just about the data. It was about the metadata and the story and putting those things together um, to talk about impact. And so um, I'm uh, part way through this paper, not all the way through this paper, but we're looking at, we're going to look at six sectors and four of them are represented here. And then really thinking about how these different sectors um, embody the ABCs and then looking at a deep case study to say, well, what does that really mean, mean, you know, to somebody? So, um, so here's kind of how I did it. It's like telling the stories, but like, the, what I'm thinking about is like, well, what do we want? I mean, when you talk about impact, right? Like, well, what do we want to do, right? Like, and how do we know when we do it? And, and if we are doing it, how do we do more of it? Like, or how can somebody else do it the way we do it so that we get more of that? And a lot of that stuff tends to come out of case studies, particularly um, as a developer, I think about the, you know, here's a co-op I admire. How can another co-op be more like that co-op or, or adapt those lessons in their community? So, um, and so part of, um, in, in sort of looking at kind of the intellectual underpinnings of, of my case study work, <laughs> Um, and I guess you might say, like, why John Dewey, right? So John Dewey is a, you know, whatever, late 19th century, <laughs> you know, American thinker, philosopher, really most well known for um, ideas on progressive education, but also wrote quite a lot about democracy. And, um, and, and kind of one of the reasons to start there is that that's an example of thinking about 
the structure of something that's pervasive, like in the case 19th century education, like they you know, whack you with a ruler on your you know, knuckle to make you learn, <laughs> and thinking about, and that was just like how everybody did it, it's how people had done it for a long time, and then trying to think about, well, what if you did it a different way, right? Like, would we get a different result? Um, to structure something, and so you know, from a co-op point of view, you know, I think one of the big lessons is structure matters, and that not for charity but for service, like that's us, and that matters, right? So that if we structure our product and service delivery and production differently, could we actually get something different out of the American economy and about people's work experiences and and all kinds of ways? And so that's you know, really the idea is like we're saying yes, it is. If we structure something different as a co-op. Um, we had the potential to get a much different and better and richer result out of that. And another part of the learning, I think, that, that comes not just from Dewey, but from lots of people, is that the process is kind of the, the part of the product. And I think we all see that in the democracy part of cooperatives, that the fact of actually being a co-op makes that thing different. I mean, it makes it different because somebody asks you. And even if you come out with the same vote that, you, that the CEOs would have had, it, it's maybe different on a lot of ways because everybody considered it and they said, yeah, I think that's the right path too. You know, I, I'm, members are all gonna vote about something. So this is a, you know, Dewey's saying education is not a preparation for life, it's life itself. And again, that, that spoke to me from a co-op point of view, is like co-op's not the end, like the co-op is the thing, right? <laughs> that we're all doing, the, the, we're cooperating, we're co-oping when we're doing things. And then part of this case study is, is to think about like, well, what does that look like when we're doing it? So anyway, this is just all kind of the background of the thinking of the case studies. And then here I think a lot of you know Ian McPherson, um, a professor, Canadian professor, um, who's just a huge intellectual light in, in this idea of co-op studies. And he had a pretty interesting paper called The Limits of Cooperation, which is one of the first papers I turned to. Because um, you know, when you think about impact, we're thinking like all these great things co-ops do. But at the same time, you know, I think all of us are cognizant of overselling, like just because it's a co-op, it's not gonna be you know, the best automatically just from being a co-op, right? They have to do something different as a co-op that has that. So, um, so reading about like how, how um, Ian, who spent his entire career thinking deeply about co-ops, um, and one of the things that he said um, you know, in this paper is he kind of looked at well, one of the ways to look at impact is like, well, what's the purpose of the founders, right? <laughs> so you're like, well, what impact does this co-op have? You're like, well, what impact is this co-op trying to have? Like, what did people want when they came together? And he kind of, you know, divides co-ops generally into these three, um, and he's really talking about English-speaking Canada, which is very similar to the US, I think, in lots of ways. Um, so one is, you know, what he called utopian co-ops. So co-ops that, um, you know, they just want the world to be a better place and everything should be a co-op and it's a cooperative commonwealth and every single thing, cradle to grave, is organized as a co-op and there's like those kinds of organizers, like that's what they want, right? And there's another kind of co-op that, that's more limited and he called it occupational, but I think that, you know, a lot of us recognize this. It's like, you know, people like us. So like we're a bunch of farmers and we need this thing happening or we're a bunch of residents of this apartment and we want something to happen in this particular way. Um, and so it's a more limited, it's not like everything, it's got a particular idea for a particular group of people. And then the third one, he, you know, it's called like liberal in sort of the British political sense, not in the American political sense, but it's really focused on individual member benefits. It's again a much even narrower focus. It was like, what have you done for me lately? I'm only going to be part of the co-op. If the co-op gets me this return, I'll be part of the co-op, but if the co-op doesn't, you know, I'm out of here. So it really has no vision at all. And so there are these co-ops that kind of divide themselves you know, in these three ways, and it's and it's not, you know, sort of judgmental in the sense of, you know, because because there are lovely examples of all these kinds of co-ops, but if you're trying to think about about impact, um, I think that there's, you know, that that what we've sort of found is that some of these these sort of um, that the ones that have the broader impact really do depend a lot actually on what the original people wanted and how they structured their co-op, and that has implications for um, what we're doing. And so one of, this is again just a little bit more from Ian McPherson, but um, which I think is, is also relevant because lots of times with, with in co-op research, and I know I say this when I'm trying to explain to somebody, you know, what is a co-op and what are you guys doing? You're like, well, we're not like a nonprofit. We're kind of not a nonprofit, you know, but we sort of have, we have benefits. We have economic impact, but we're not a nonprofit. And we are a business, but we're not an investor owned business. We're not like one of those guys and we're not like one of these other guys. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, we miss a lot if we just talk about ourselves as a residual category, like not what somebody else does. <laughs> and really what we should be talking about is what, what we do and what we are, 
like and something that's special about us. And I thought that really, again, just as a sort of foundational way of looking at, at these cases, um, that that's really important and that we need to give ourselves, you know, the respect um, that, that we deserve as co-ops and that, and that um, we succeed or fail on the terms that we decide, right, is a successful or not successful co-op. And that's a co-op community decision. It's not somebody else saying, well, you're better at this than a nonprofit, but you're not as good as something else. And we're like, no, we are what we are. And, um, you know, and again, just from the sort of uh, inspirational, you know, Ian's like the most important determinant you know, is knowledge and we can't, you know, we can't envision something we can't see, right? And so from a, and again, my, you know, experiences as an economic development um, person and the, the most impactful way <laughs> that people learn, that ad adults anyway learn and that people that want to do a co-op is seeing somebody who's doing something that's like what they want to do. And they're like, yeah, I want to be like that, except I want it, you know, to be this in this way. And so peer learning is super, super, super important in co-ops. And that's, I think, again, what kind of what this case study thing is about is like trying to institute that in, in the context of a broader, you know, impact study is, is saying, you know, we have to be able to envision it. So one of the things we want to do here, we're giving you four really wonderful, very diverse case studies to help, you know, everybody think a little bit about like, yeah, I want to be more like that, right? Like I want to, you know, that's a, that's some vision. <laughs> so, um, so when we started, again, looking for who was going to be in the case studies, I mean, one of the things, and I think, again, we all know this, but, but the great co-ops exist everywhere. They are all sizes. They are every state. They are in all industries. So there's, like, no such thing, like, I can't do that in my particular co-op because dot, dot, dot. Like, there are great co-ops everywhere. And that was super inspiring um, in just kind of looking at some of these things broadly. And another thing, I, I guess, when I, you know, was thinking about, again, back to Ian, sort of, three kinds of co-ops, um, it seemed to me that when I got right down to it, like when I sorted through, you know, 70 whatever different kinds of co-ops to find the six that were going to be part of the study, 70 different ones that I just like off the top of my head and I asked, you know, who do I think are great co-ops and I asked people, you know, the ones that really were making the, the lasting impact, it seemed that, that most of them started from sort of that middle occupational category, right? They started with a pretty core, you know, accessible, idea which wasn't, which is not to say changing the world isn't a great thing, but they mostly had something that was a little bit more closer, you know, we want to change the world, but first we want to do this one thing, like get, <laughs> get this market or increase our sales or, you know, do something specific. So they started with an occupational bond, but I think the important lesson that, that we'll see from our cases is, is that they don't end that way. Like they didn't just stop there. They didn't say, okay, I want it to be the best something, something co-op in this particular part of the world and now I've done it and we're just going to sit here and be that forever, you know? They were like, the co-ops that did that, they did that, they were like the best electric co-op in this area, and then they're like, what else can we do, right? Or they were the best credit union for a you know, group of, a, a segment of, of employees, but they didn't like stop and say, um, and I, I think uh, Carla's is one of the best examples. It's a DC credit union, DC, it's a, just a bread and butter, you know, employee-based uh, credit union, but they didn't stop there. They didn't say, okay, now we've done the best thing for all the DC employees, and that's just like all we're ever gonna do because those are our members. You know, They were like, wow, we have this base of resources and knowledge and everything. What else can we do? What else is useful out there? Who else could be our members? What else is going on? And so that's when you start to really see people changing the world is, is from that kind of perspective, is really leveraging their knowledge and their um, membership and their resources and their assets and, and all of that stuff. Um, and the, um, so I, I kind of like made it, it's sort of like the occupational that makes thoughtful forays into utopian territory. And again, it's not like the utopian ones um, don't work, it's just that, um, that it's hard to find a group of people that have the same vision of all these different things, of how the whole universe is going to work. It's easier to find a group of people that already have some existing relationship that have a vision, you know, that's about two feet out in front of them instead of two miles out in front of them. But then to be able to take that two feet and take it, that's really great. And I think, you know, if you think about the Rochdale pioneers that we all love, I mean, that's really what they did. You know, they were like super visionary. They were changing the world. They were utopian. But when you came right down to it, it was like, we're going to sell candles and flour and sugar and it doesn't have crap in it. And everybody's like, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so that will get people in the door and then you you know and then from there you can you know build a international movement of cooperation but you start with some of these basic things um, and I think one of the other and this is just sort of anecdotally but the third the category the sort of individual member benefit 
And again, I don't mean to disparage because we're not good co-ops if we don't deliver individual member benefits. I mean, that is what we're about. But part of the difference is like if that's all you do and you're like, what have you done for me lately? You know, I didn't get as, as good a something something. I didn't, you know, get the price I wanted. So I'm going to sell to somebody else next year. You know, like it's hard to maintain those as co-ops. And that, that's really where we see the demutualization kind of threat coming are when people are very, very focused on the short-term financial, specific financial gain, and not on a sort of medium-term, you know, basic gain of something. So um, anyway, so the, in, the, in the division, that's where that was kind of, anyway, I'm interested what people think about this, because this whole part of the paper is still in. Um, as Brett said, he presented and got like torn apart, so I'm looking forward to that process at, <laughs> at some point, if this sort of framing makes sense to people. Um, and a couple, uh, you know, before we get to the case, just a couple important things. I think a big part of this co-op impact has to do with your sense of timing. And I, you know, I've been using this quotation like for 20 years when I trained about co-ops. Does everyone know who this is? I never lost a game. I just ran out of time. It's, it's, it's either Vince Lombardi or Michael Jordan. They both claim it. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it's an important concept because it's like the time makes a big difference, right? Like everybody can, you know, claim success if you you know, do your little diagram differently or whatever. But um, so one of, so it makes a big, so timing makes a big difference. Actually, your, your framework of what it is, not just what you want to do, but like what is your frame of reference and your impact and do you want to, like how long are you doing, you know? And like William Nelson was always talking about, you know, you want to plant something that you will, you want to plant a tree that you will never in your lifetime be able to see the benefit of. Like that's what you want to do. Like that's the visionary stuff. But you know, you're mixing that in with the everyday bread and butter. We're selling unadulterated flour come into our store. You're also selling like an oak tree that, you know, your grandkids will sit under, right? So that's the, the combination. So, you know, kind of looking at these, like the utopian, if it's utopian only, it takes a long time to make a meaningful impact for a lot of people. Although those kinds of co-ops can make a very meaningful impact for you know for a smaller group of people. So it's not like they're not impactful. It's just like if you're talking about kind of big picture stuff, it's hard to do really big things with a whole bunch of people all at the same time and have this common vision. Um, but at the same time, the the individual member benefit co-ops you know tended to have too short of a timeline. They're kind of like you know what's our quarter result? What did you do for me this year? If I haven't got any thing, you know, if I haven't got my benefit this year, I'm not going to join next year, I'm not going to sell through the co-op next year or whatever, you know. And that's pretty hard to like change the world if you're if you're just running in place every for every quarterly result. And so a lot of the, you know, the changes that I think the things that, that we saw in the study is that um, when you change your focus from an investor driven quarterly focus to a member driven like benefit service focus, you, it's really liberating. And um, uh, Mike will talk about from Bark Electric, just in terms of investing and you know broadband and solar and stuff. It's like, well, a, you know, a, a for-profit investor needs to make their return in three years, right? But does an electric co-op? Electric? It's not like they're doing it for free, but they can take ten years to get their money back. Like, what if you had a longer timeline? What difference would that make to the community? And it makes enormous difference to the community. Enormous, enormous difference into access to this critical resource. If you just start thinking about it as like a practical benefit for people and not, you know, as I have to make my money, you know, yesterday or I'm out of here. Um, and finally, another thing that, that I think is a really important part of impact, it just permeates a whole bunch of ways that the co-op difference, you know, tells itself, is this idea of, of membership and democracy. Um, because when you think about sort of the residual, cat, like we're not a nonprofit and we're not an investor-owned business, like a lot of what we are, like neither of those models have, have the democracy and membership aspect that we have. And that's a really key part of the definition. And, and you'll really see a lot of that impact coming both directly and indirectly from that idea of, of membership and of member democracy um, and, and how that impact happens. And so, you know, uh, obviously that makes a difference on a firm level, on a co-op level. I mean, you wouldn't be much of a co-op if you weren't making a difference for your members, like within your co-op. But uh, we also see, and you kind of get in, you know, the community co-op make to, to lots of people in the community, to the family members of your, you know, employees or whatever. And Alexander Valley's got, a, I think, a really good illustration of really the industry level, like the organic dairy industry operates differently because Organic Valley is a big player and they operate differently. So they didn't say, we're going to be just like every other dairy company, we have to be. They're like, we're going to be a co-op and we're going to respond to our members. And then that's actually going to change the world instead of the world changing us, which I think is really, is really um, important individual member level, and that's really what the case studies are really good for because it's very hard to measure individual
individual impacts, you know, you can do surveys and a bunch of stuff, but it's very time consuming to measure, even though we all know that that's real. Um, so I like, you know, Paul Bradley from, from Oculus and the um, manufacturer home communities talking about what difference democracy makes on an individual basis for people who want to live in, um, in those communities. I mean, it's huge, you know. So, um, so I think we'll see that, and that's something that's really really tied to the democratic aspect because there are differences, there are things that happen with a cooperative owned uh, manufacturing companies that don't happen even when nonprofits, even when nice people and good people own the parks, right? You know, they aren't quite the same and so how is that different? Um, so again, I'm just going to end with this like co-ops, like we're not, not something else. <laughs> we're our own thing and so that's what we've got four really interesting case studies of, of people talking about the co-op difference and how the co-op um, structure makes a difference in their um, so I'm going to ask our panelists to come up now. So we have four, four different panelists, and I think I'm pretty much on time. I'm going to uh, give you each an order about maybe 12 minutes to just talk about your co-op and, you know, your general, um, what you do and, you know, how you think about impact and, and cooperative impact in your communities. And then we're going to end with, we have some questions and, and other stuff at the end. So um, let's see. Are we, who wants to start? We have to start one end or the other. Jerry, you want to start? I can start. <laughs> okay. So, um, and do you want to come up here? Or you want to sit? I'm pretty comfortable. Is that all right? <laughs> you guys hear me? <laughs> all right. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, Jerry McGeorge, Vice President of Cooperative <laughs> Affairs for Organic Valley um, Dairy Cooperative in Lafarge, Wisconsin. Great. Thank you, Margaret, and uh, glad to be here today. So, as Margaret said, my name is Jerry McGeorge. Um, I'm the Vice President of Cooperative Affairs at Organic Valley. Crop Cooperative is our name, but Organic Valley is really the brand that consumers would know us by. Um, so let me give a little background. We started in 1988, and that was sort of the height of the uh, agricultural farm crisis in this country that, that was occurring in the 80s. Um, and we started in southwest Wisconsin, which is where our, our home still is. Uh, and we had a group of farmers that uh, were coming together and, you know, some in response to this ag crisis. And they were trying to figure out, you know, what they might be able to do. And in our area of the world, um, the other sort of factor that was happening at that point was the, the predominant cash crop in that area of the world, small area of Wisconsin, was tobacco. So you would often have dairy farmers who would be doing their dairy and they'd have three, four, five acres of tobacco that really was kind of what made the difference at the end of the year when they closed their books. And that was going away. And so not only were these farmers dealing with sort of the, the general crisis that was going on, but but the demand for the, the tobacco they had been growing had been going away. And so a group of them got together and, and they decided that what they wanted to do uh, was go into organic farming. And this is a time where consumer um, uptake was starting, but it was still you know, pretty nascent at that time. Uh, but they were looking at it and they thought that, that quite perhaps this was um, you know, a real opportunity and a little bit, you know, what Margaret was saying, um, for them, they thought they could demand a higher price in the market if they did that. But it also started to be a, a case of, and what is it that we're doing that, that has broader impact? And the idea that, that using these organic uh, agricultural methods, not using uh, uh, synthetic fertilizers and, and pesticides on the land was something that, that they wanted to do as well. And so hence they, you know, they came together and they started. And the interesting thing, what, what a lot of folks don't know is the very first group uh, were produce farmers, vegetable farmers. But very, very quickly, a group of uh, months really from the beginning, a group of seven dairy farmers got together. And they wanted to you know, see what, what it would be like to, to market organic dairy products. And so, you know, fast forward, um, we still have the produce, but it's a tiny, tiny part of our business. Um, we also market at this point um, organic eggs, organic meat, uh, poultry, beef, and pork. And um, really, though, when you talk about us 
it's, it's a story of dairy mostly. Uh, about 88, 89% of our revenue is derived from the dairy side of our business. Um, at this point, so you know, I said Southwest Wisconsin is where we started a group of maybe seven farmers. We currently are at a, about 2,000 farmer members, and those farmers are spread across 35, 36 states. So pretty broad, uh, you know, footprint across the country at this point. Um, and our revenues at this point are $1.1 billion. So we have been able to, you know, start very humbly. And, you know, it was a big deal when we went across the river from, you know, the, the Wisconsin into Minnesota back in about 1994. But, you know, currently, as I said, more like 35, 36 states and, and 2,000 or so members. Um, our employee base is about 1,000. And I bring that up um, because, again, our, our headquarters in southwest Wisconsin, uh, particularly uh, Vernon County, uh, this is a county that has about 30,000 people in it, so very, very rural. Um, and traditionally, Vernon County is in, for sure, the, the bottom five uh, counties in our state in terms of uh, poverty and, and income. And so, you know, the impact that we have been able to create over the years is not just for those members. And, and those 2,000 members, it's been a huge impact for bought these, you know, this uh, about a thousand employees that we have. So we're creating jobs, most of which are in this uh, small area of Southwest Wisconsin. Um, and they're good, they're good jobs. We, this year, uh, instituted a policy where we, we um, now have a $15 an hour minimum wage. Anybody that works here uh, will make at least that. And so, you know, the, it's a commitment. We recognize that, yes, the farmers are the members. And so there's a huge commitment to those members and engagement of those members, um, but so too is there with the employees. And so, you know, those are the two key stakeholders, I believe, for our co-op. Um, and we're blessed. We have a, you know, a very motivated and um, uh, aligned with the cooperative values of uh, employee base. So it's not just those farmers. I think both of those, those groups working hand in hand. I often talk about, you know, that's sort of the partnership that makes the engine run uh, at Organic Valley. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's what I got. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? My mic keeps going up. Okay, great. Um, so Mike, Mike, next is Mike Kaiser, who's the CEO of Bark Electric Co-op in Mulberry, Virginia. And so just tell us a little bit about your story and how your co-op Sure. So, so Bark Electric, it's, uh, it's actually an acronym for the counties that we serve, Bath, Allegheny, Rockbridge County. We're about three hours southwest of here um, in the Shenandoah. We serve mostly the Shenandoah Valley up into the Allegheny Mountains to the West Virginia border to our western territory and our eastern territory. We go to the top of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's about 2,000 square miles of service territory. Um, we've got more trees than people. We've got about 13,000 electric meters right now. Um, and the, really the history of Bark is the, I'm, I'm gonna tell you the story because it influences what we're getting into today, which is high-speed internet. Um, but the history of Bark is really the history of rural electrification across the country. Um, you know, in Virginia, Dominion, the predecessor to Dominion had cherry-picked the densely populated areas back in the 1920s and 30s. And, uh, the rural folks did not have like, access to electric electricity, so they formed electric cooperatives um, to bring power, um, poles and wire and electricity to the, their farms and their homes and their businesses. Um, and that's the foundation of BARC. We, uh, we started in 1930, 38, it was formed, 39, the first customer got connected. Um, and really we, uh, through, a, through a program at the USDA Rural, rural Development, Rural Utility Service, we were able to bring um, electric, electricity to every single member who enters our territory now today, no matter, no matter how remote or how, how far away you are from our power lines, you know, we, we'll bring you electrical power. Um, and today, um, we really don't view ourselves as just an electric utility anymore. We view ourselves as really being a service to the member. Our, we're in the quality of life business, really. Um, and a couple of things that we're expanding into now are solar initiatives, um, we view the electric grid as really just one service that we provide to our members. Um, but if they, ha if they have a desire for another type of, of energy service, whether it's solar or it's batteries, 
we feel like as a cooperative, we're in the best position to serve that need for that, for that member. So we've done some um, pretty special solar projects. We were the first co-op in Virginia to offer community solar to our members. So we built a centralized array. It's about half a megawatt, um, soon to be expanded out because we have a waiting list for it, um, where customers can subscribe to the output of that facility and get a, get, a, get a fixed rate on their bill for the next 20 years. And that was so popular that it actually out, out, oversubscribed before we even put the first pole on the ground. Um, and uh, today we're, we're expanding into high-speed internet. So we're, we've, we've made the commitment to build um, high-speed or fiber, a fiber network, fiber to the home, to all of our members over the next, say, three to five year period. Um, it's going to double our balance sheet, so it's, it was a big risk that our, my board of directors undertook in approving the project, but we felt like it, met, it was the exact story of our, of our origin, you know, of, of rural folks not having access to high-speed internet, um, that the city of Lexington and the, and the more densely populated areas around our territory have access to internet through Comcast, um, but our folks don't. They are either on dial-up still, if you can believe it, they're on DSL or they're on satellite. Many of them have never even streamed a Netflix movie, if you can imagine that, uh, today. And um, last week, we just went over 500 connected subscribers to our network, and we've got over 800 signed up right now. And we're, we're, we're growing so fast on the broadband side, I, I, I really do believe that in the near future, broadband's gonna eclipse um, the electric utility in terms of the demand, because the number one question my board and, and my, my uh, staff at VARC get is, when's internet coming to my house? But that, the customers just can't wait, can't wait for it. Thank you. Um, so Paul Bradley is the president of Rock USA out of Concord, New Hampshire, but a national effort for residents of manufactured home communities. And um, so Paul, can you just tell a little bit about, about your folks and, and the co-op difference, the co-op impact? Sure, so uh, Rock USA is a nonprofit social venture based in Concord, New Hampshire. We've been operating nationally for 11 years. We started in 1984 in New Hampshire, scaling the cooperative ownership model uh, in manufactured home communities, or what many people know as mobile home parks. So between 1984 and uh, 2008, uh, New Hampshire became uh, home to about 5,000 co-op members in roughly 80 manufactured home communities or mobile home parks. And over the last 11 years, we've grown from 80 communities to 237 communities and 15,500 homeowners, uh, members. Uh, that uh, really is, uh, as you've, uh, you know, we doubled the number of homes in co-ops in the first six and a half years of Rock USA operating nationally and have again uh, gone from 10 to 15,000 homes in the last uh, three and a half years. And uh, what we learned in New Hampshire is, is true nationally. Homeowners, when they own the home but rent the land under their home from a third party investor, are highly motivated to form a co-op and buy the land when given the opportunity. Um, homeowners have demonstrated, uh, A, their interest in doing that, and two, their resilience, uh, their sustainability of ownership. Uh, they have, uh, in those 237 communities, not one of them has ever resold their community filed for bankruptcy or faced a foreclosure. Um, and these are all uh, low-income neighborhoods operated on a democratic, uh, cooperative basis. Really pretty remarkable record uh, for these communities. Um, we are scaling this nationally through a network of, of nonprofit organizations, a number of cooperative technical assistance centers, some of who are in the room, Cooperative Development Institute, Northwest Cult Development Center, uh, and perhaps others. Um, it's a, it's a social venture with local boots on the ground, able uh, expert technical assistance providers that help homeowners through the purchase process, but also uh, over time through their ownership phase, and a national community development financial institution, CDFI, to finance co-ops around the country. And uh, we firmly believe that uh, one cannot scale if one's not thinking and operating sustainably, so we not only think about sustainability at the cooperative level, but also at the national social venture level and throughout the network of, of cooperative technical assistance centers. So, um, so that's who we are. I'd say in terms of uh, cooperative impact in communities, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty outstanding. Uh, the fact of the matter is this is a group of homeowners that live with tremendous insecurity. So, 
folks um, who listen to the 99% Invisible podcast heard a story about uh, a group of homeowners in Salt Lake County, Utah. Their community was threatened by redevelopment uh, in the manufactured home community sector. You can be evicted for change of use because, again, the land is owned by a third-party investor. So these 60 uh, primarily senior homeowners uh, banded together, bought the community because two local developers were actually sympathetic to their, to their plight. Um, they had tremendous support from the city, the state, uh, but it really took uh, local technical assistance and a national CDFI and our, our uh, expertise to help make it all happen for them. They are now safe and secure in their community. Uh, that is really what resident ownership is all about, safety and security, but not in just the traditional sense of feeling safe in your street, but actual in manufactured home communities, the, the, the roads, the utilities are all uh, owned by the co-op, so, uh, and previously owned by third-party investors. So safety and security in manufactured home communities includes uh, sewer systems that work, uh, water systems that work, uh, electrical systems uh, that don't fry people, uh, roads and drainage and tree maintenance that um, you know, are all attended to. Uh, and security also includes economic security, as I said, from uh, risk of community closure and excessive rent increases. And I would just say, uh, if anybody's interested in uh, and isn't, uh, hasn't already seen the John Oliver video that played a month ago or three weeks ago now, um, just Google John Oliver mobile homes, and if you're okay with F-bombs and an occasional sexual innuendo, <laughs> uh, it'll give you a very good insight into what we're uh, what we're competing against uh, in the business, but also what homeowners are facing uh, and how they're viewed by commercial investors or some commercial investors in this space. Not all commercial investors, but some. All right, great, thank you. Okay, um, and our, our fourth speaker is Carla Decker, a local hero, a president and CEO of the DC Credit Union here in um, the district. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my credit union is right here in the district. It was formed in the 1950s, and it was formed to serve the local government workforce, um, majority of whom were African American and were literally had no or very little access to financial services, particularly to access to credit. So they formed this co-op, and they, the the credit union, uh, operated for a number of decades. And, and then, about 20 years ago, or more or less, there were a lot of changes that took place in the district um, in terms of demographic shifts, in terms of uh, even uh, age and uh, gentrification. If you saw a recent article, DC is the most gentrified city in the entire United States. And that comes you know, with pluses, but it comes with a lot of minuses as well. For instance, in the district, um, the most prevalent poverty takes place in zip codes where more than half of the residents are people of color. In the district, 8% um, of the residents are actually unbanked, as opposed to six, I'm sorry, 8% of the, the residents are unbanked as opposed to 6.5% at a national level. 21% are underbanked as opposed to 19% at the national level. In the district, one third of our residents actually have subprime credit. So you can see that there is a tremendous gap in, in wealth that translates into a tremendous gap of opportunity. Not everybody can take advantage of all of the, the riches and just uh, you know, the beauty and, and privilege that it is to live in the nation's capital. And so, um, and so our credit union, which um, up to 20 years ago was a, almost 100% African American, experienced something in, within the cooperative, and that was that the credit union was very vulnerable to any economic fluctuations or financial fluctuations of the DC government. When rifts took place, um, you know, uh, as, as gentrification also and diversity uh, also took place in, in the local government, there were things that just were affecting the credit union, and the co-op was not as successful, financially successful or sustainable as it could have been. At the same time, and this is the late 90s, early 2000s, at the same time, uh, we had seen a tremendous influx of immigrants, particularly of uh, Latino. And uh, a small community development coordinator had been formed to serve these Latinos. 
the this this cartoon was very small. It was a startup. Uh, there, you know, you know all of the reasons why a co-op doesn't doesn't necessarily sometimes uh, succeed, and and unfortunately, this was the truth for this particular community development cartoon. And so the regulator stepped in and said, "We're going to dissolve you." Um, and literally approached our credit union because, because we were geographically near, our headquarters were geographically close to the headquarters of this CDCU. Aside from that geographic uh, closeness or, or vicinity, there was nothing else that really linked one set of members to the other set of members. Um, but, but there was the understanding that by DC Credit Union, that we needed to do something different or we would just be extinct. Be extinct. So, um, so at that time, the, the board, uh, through the membership, embraced this idea of ensuring that, um, that we would become more inclusive for, for not just the business sustainability, but I think at the same time, because our core members were DC government employees. And so they worked in agencies that were providing social services to the most vulnerable people. And they understood that that population, of the most vulnerable people included immigrants. And therefore, sort of as an extension of their own work, they decided that the co-op should also do the same thing. So um, today, we are a community development financial institution. We are a low-income designated credit union, and we are a minority-owned financial depository. We pursue a mission of financial inclusion, um, and we do this by, by ensuring that our services, our work, is focused on those people who are most vulnerable. Uh, for us, that continues to be immigrants, but it includes people who are of low um, and moderate income households. It includes the youth, particularly the youth that is at risk particularly um, our youth of, of color. Um, I could talk forever <laughs> about all of the different programs and services that we offer, uh, but they're banking services. They're the same things that you would find you know, anywhere else, right? Um, the difference is how we deliver. The difference is in our commitment to create access and to create that engagement. The difference is, our, is understanding that the problems that, that our people in our community faces are so huge that we we alone cannot do it all. That we have to partner and stand hand in hand with the local government agencies, the local community-based organizations, and that together we can create more impact than what we would do you know, completely alone. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, the credit union is thriving. Um, we, by serving youth, we uh, don't have the same type of challenges or perhaps other credit unions or other co-ops where we see an aging membership. The, the opposite is happening at our credit union. Our board is extremely diverse uh, and we have people from community, people who are not underserved, people who are not low income or low wealth who bank with us because they believe in the mission. And, and, and ultimately the credit union ha continues to grow, um, has a really strong capital base and its commitment to financial inclusion continues. So much so that we are, um, we're looking at our, our brand footprint and we're looking at just how do we continue to scale these, these services. That makes sense. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm just gonna take advantage of a little of my insider knowledge. I have a couple questions for each of them of things I think are really special about their stories to um, expand on and then we're gonna open it up for anybody else that has questions. So I'm gonna start with, um, with Paul. So what you do is, is obviously super important to people and super impactful, but somebody might say, well, you know, a nonprofit could do that same thing, right? Mm -hmm. The nonprofit could own, I mean, a nonprofit own lots of affordable housing. So can you just talk a little bit about what's, what's the co-op difference? What difference does democracy make and why is that what you guys are so committed to doing? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, there are nonprofits as well as some uh, public housing agencies that do own manufactured home communities as a preservation strategy. And in a lot of state law, you'll see uh, where co ops and nonprofits are treated equally in terms of opportunity to purchase legislation. So this question gets asked quite a bit. Um, and uh, I'd say, uh, from my point of view, the most important thing when uh, for, for the homeowners themselves is for them to make that choice, frankly, between 
co-op ownership and nonprofit ownership. The state of Vermont, for instance, state law for opportunity to purchase, where the homeowners actually have a right to purchase the land before another third party investor comes in to acquire the land. That law exists in four states solidly. It would be wonderful if it existed in more states. But that law is set up so that the homeowners would make a democratic choice between a nonprofit, third party nonprofit ownership and resident ownership. Uh, since Cooperative Development Institute runs the New England uh, Resident Owned Community Program as an affiliate of Rock USA Network, has arrived in the state of Vermont, not one uh, group of homeowners has chosen nonprofit ownership. Uh, every one of them has chosen uh, resident ownership. Uh, that is in stark contrast to, to prior to 2009, uh, prior to entering the state, uh, uh, the majority, great majority, uh, all chose nonprofit ownership because that was the supported model in the state. Uh, so that's just evidence of homeowners themselves making that choice for themselves. And frankly, it comes down to, um, regardless of whether it's a, a, a mission-based nonprofit or quasi-public agency, um, people want control. Uh, they don't want to trust a third party. Uh, they want uh, ownership and control themselves. And when they see other homeowner groups that have, have succeeded at uh, owning and controlling or managing their own properties, uh, it only more motivates them uh, to, to take that step. Um, and then of course, you know, we make a significant investment in ongoing leadership development, both at a local, regional, uh, and, and national level. So in a month from now, or four weeks from now, we'll be at Southern New Hampshire University for our Rock Leadership Institute which the Cooperative Development Foundation is a sponsor of, which we greatly appreciate. Um, and uh, we'll have 100 co-op leaders from around the country coming to Southern New Hampshire University for three days of leadership development. And, and so when they're supported in their ownership, um, then they have the tools and the ongoing support to uh, do that effectively. Uh, they know they're buying into a system of support, in other words, and that, that helps them make that decision and gives them the confidence that they, they and the future leaders will have the ability to to own this responsibly. Great, thank you. Um, and then, so Mike, one of the things that I found so impressive um, talking to you about your co-op is the work that you've done with school districts locally, both with the broadband and with the solar projects, and how, and not, again, it's kind of not just what you've done, but it's how you've done it. And so it's not just delivering stuff to school, but just in, in um, helping the school districts build their own capacity uh, you know, to own their own solar and, and that kind of thing and what implication that has in our, our rural community. I think so many of us um, are in communities that struggle with funding for public schools and it just seems like you guys were just the fairy godmother in, uh, in so many ways. So can you just talk a little bit about both the broadband and the, and the solar projects you've done with schools? Yeah, uh, let me talk about a few of the projects that we've done on a kind of back end to why or how, how yeah. we got into those. Um, so we. We've connected one of the school districts to our, to our fiber network, and one of the elementary schools in particular went from having about a three meg connection. So imagine a whole elementary school getting three megs of, of, of bandwidth for all of their students. Um, paying, by the way, they were paying $1,300 a month for that three meg connection, um, just, getting ra just getting raked over the coals. And um, we've pulled fiber into that school, and today they're getting 250 meg synchronous for $500 a month. So we saved them seven hundred dollars a month, and you know I, I don't even know what the multiple is on that bandwidth, yeah. but right, it's big. Um, and then as a result of that initiative, getting that whole school district connected to fiber, um, the school district went out and bought eighteen hundred um, Chromebooks for their students who had never been able to use them before because they didn't have internet. Um, and a lot of these kids now are getting internet at home because their parents live in the, you know in, on our on our electric system. So they're now able to do a lot of stuff at home and at school with the internet that they didn't have, didn't have the ability to do before. I and mean, that's really, that's really why, we, why we got into the project, it's huge. Um, with Bath County School District, we did a solar project, um, rooftop solar project, it was the biggest one in, in Virginia, I think it still might be the biggest one. 1.1 um, megawatts of rooftop solar on all three schools in Bath County. The, uh, the elementary school, Valley, uh, elementary has Valley, it has uh, net zero school today. So 100% of the, energy on an annual basis, right, it doesn't produce solar at night, but on an annual basis, um, it, it basically breaks even on the meter at zero. And they've used the, the, the program we brought to them was, 
we will build it and, and fund it for you, and you, you use the savings you get from net metering these installations against your utility bill to pay us back for the construction and the maintenance costs of the solar project. So you really don't have to come out of pocket with a $1.75 million purchase to buy this thing. We will borrow the money and build it for you, since we're the experts, we'll maintain it for you, um, and then you'll just get basically 50% of your energy at a fixed rate for the next 20 years, and we are able to do it at, at today's electric rates. So they aren't even paying a premium today, and they've fixed in half their electric bill for 20 years, and then after 20 years, it's basically free energy except for the maintenance cost. Um, so, so, I mean, taking that to the school board was a no-brainer. I mean, that, what are they gonna <laughs> say, no to that uh, proposal? Um, but then things have come out of that uh, that really were unanticipated. So the, the high school um, created a renewable energy STEM class that they now teach this year. This is the first year they've taught that class to students. Um, I was at the school board meeting not that long ago presenting sort of the one year review of the project and there, there's students that are at the meeting and one of the students spoke up and said that they were just, how proud they were that their school is leading the whole commonwealth in solar energy being this, I mean they know they're in sort of the back water, backwoods of Virginia, they're sort of forgotten back here um, in rural Virginia, but the fact that they have this project that really nobody else has is really a point of pride for the students and just did not even something that we even thought about when we, were, when we were developing the project was the fact that these kids are, the impact it's gonna have on these kids as they're going through school and knowing what their school district did and, and just having that awareness is really cool. Um, we, we donate regularly to well, several schools, um, renewable energy programs, we participate in their career days. We, at the Community Solar Project, we built a um, solar learning center, we call it, at on-site with the, with the array and, and I, we built it because I've got little kids right now at home and, I was thinking, how you know, if, where would they want to go? I mean, wouldn't this be such a cool field trip for them to take to come to a, sol a big solar array and walk around and see the panels up close, and then come into the classroom and we can talk to them about how solar energy works and how it gets fed onto electric grid, and can lead into a conversation about the co-op and about electrical safety and all that. Um, so we've hosted a lot of schools that have come to that classroom, and why we did all that and why we are doing all that is is really because um, the the vast majority of our workforce comes out of those two school districts, the big two school districts that we serve. Um, and so investing in the schools and uh, you know, participating in their development, we're really just investing in the future of our own employees and, we're, and all of it is leading towards hopefully keeping the, the young people in the community and not moving away to an urban, urban area, which we've seen one of the reasons we got into broadband was because um, a lot about migration, we saw reduced electric sales, we saw reduced you know, we're, we were disconnecting more meters than we were connecting on an annual basis. I mean, people are just are leaving. There's nothing, there's nothing going on. And so hope, we're hoping that by all the efforts we're undertaking in our community, we can sort of turn, turn the tide and at least be a foundation for the counties then to um, drive some economic development. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just thought about the idea of this. <laughs> Kids like, we're the coolest school in the whole <laughs> 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 um, Okay. Um, Carla, I think um, there's like a million things that are interesting about your credit union, but one of the things I found particularly interesting um, was the kinds of, of products. I mean, um, you know, there's like, I mean, credit unions are pretty bread and butter, and you know, you do your check accounts and your car loans and things, and those are all super, super important. But I feel like since you guys have taken kind of a step into being a CDFI, you, you, you don't go away from those, but you've really developed some interesting things. I'm thinking like your citizenship loan and and some other things. So can you talk a little bit about um, how these, what, what, what are some of the innovative products and how those came out of your membership? Sure. So the, so the what, the products are, you know, are, are pretty standard. I think that the, the difference um, and where our members have had a push is on the why. Why do we offer the products that we offer? Why do we price the products as we price them? And, and that is very much driven on the, the values of, of the co-op, uh, the values of our members. And then the how, right? Because it's, we recognize that, that people have sort of like a, a financial life that mirrors a path and you start, and you start base, with basic needs um, and then you, you graduate to all of these other more complex asset building, wealth building activities that are supported by the products that we offer. Um, and so for us, it's the issue of how do you, how do you make sure that as you, uh, as you, meet somebody who is banking in this country for the first time, that you place them with the right set of tools, financial tools, 
so that they can be prepared to fully participate in, in, in the economy, to fully be benefit from everything that DC has to offer. Um, and so, and so we, we know that while our, the demographics of our membership are very varied and the needs are very varied, that for the most part, if you think about that path and you put a certain number of products there, then it's just a matter of how you tweak them or how you offer them, how you underwrite them to make sure that you have the highest level of debt inclusivity. Um, and so, for instance, um, we know that everybody at some point in their life takes out a first loan. Um, but the experience is very different based on who you are and where you come from. So for a citizen, um, the experience may come at some point later in life, um, and it may also come at some point where they really are in need of, of something that they would not be able to attain otherwise, and so it's so important, but they really don't have the wherewithal to first know that they need the loan or that the loan can make a difference, um, or two, they're just not prepared to qualify from an underwriting perspective for that loan. Um, and so we, in, in thinking about um, our immigrant citizens, we think about, again, thinking about community, we think about the community-based organizations that are around, the work that is done. And so there are some immigration service uh, community-based organizations that are working with that are working with individuals who don't have, um, who are not citizens of the United States, and they know that they've been working with them. They know that you know this person can actually pass into citizenship; that they're now eligible for residency. Um, but perhaps this person hasn't paid taxes in the past. Perhaps this person has to show that they have lived here for a number of, for a particular period. And for a fact, in order to apply for this new status, they must pay a fee. It is that relationship between the consumer and the, the uh, community-based organization that is sort of, for us, the, the underwriter or the, the safeguard of how we're gonna underwrite this loan because now we know that in fact there is a need, we know that the need is valid and that the person is qualified to attain something more um, because they have already been deemed so by the community-based organization. Um, and so it is a community-based organization that then says to us, hey, Credit Union, I have somebody, I have a consumer who actually needs of your services, and all they need is this loan. They don't need a checking account, they don't need a men market, they just need this particular loan. So we tool, we shape a, a loan that basically looks like something, you know, that would fit that, um, and that becomes our citizenship loan. We're underwriting that loan literally based on the relationship that we have with community-based organization who by extension knows the member. Um, and there are a number of different uh, products that are like that, that again, you know, if you just go to the roots or the foundation of the product itself, it's something that is something that you would recognize. Um, so for instance, a checking account. Everybody needs a checking account. Well, the city has a very robust summer jobs program and it literally hires all of these young people from ages 14 to 24 every single summer. And out of that program, you have graduates who are now leaders in you know, the entire spectrum of, of, of society in Washington, D.C. Um, some of the younger kids are children who come from at, who are at risk. Um, their family situation is very unstable. Sometimes there is no family situation in their wards of the state. If we think about a checking account for a person who is going to get their first job, who is actually going to be getting a salary, and you know they're going to get a salary because they're actually employed, you see an employment letter. How do you then offer that checking account to somebody who is 14 years old and doesn't have an adult to sign for them? You can offer it the same way that you would do somebody who is perhaps an immigrant and doesn't have all of the documentation required to open an account. So we sort of learn from one group put onto the other, just sort of like, you know, up one, one element of a product to the other. But at the end of the day, they're all the same products, and they're all products that any one of you would recognize just by going to any other, any other financial institution. So again, I think uh, for us, the, you know, the why we do this is very much driven by the values, very much driven by the mission, and then the how we do it uh, is, where the, is where the magic takes place. It's really where, um, it's really where, where we're looking at not just the relationships, but ultimately, you know, how do we 
how do we make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to fully benefit from a financial institution, a relationship with a financial institution? That goes beyond that transaction, but it's more the long term. Great, thank you. Um, and so Jerry, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit um, more about Organic Valley and kind of your, your concept of price stability and sustainability and, and how that shapes you know, the origins and the ongoing um, growth of the co-op. Sure. And then um, also, because one of the things I thought was, was so interesting was how that really has affected the actual, like the organic dairy industry. So it's affected farmers that aren't your members. I mean, that your concept is a co-op, and like how did that happen? Can you just talk a little bit? Sure. Um, okay, so these, these twin concepts of sustainability and stability are, they're, they're actually separate, but very, very related. Um, one of our founders had a saying that I really like when describing our business, and he, he liked to say that we're a social experiment disguised as a business. Um, and I also think now in this conversation, it's a little bit, um, we're an economic uh, experiment uh, posing as a business a little bit as well. And what I mean by that is, um, so this, this concept of, of, of sustainability, you know, back to the late 80s, right, and, and a farm crisis. Well, what was the crisis? Well, the crisis was farmers were going out of business. They couldn't make money. And, you know, our farmers, again, as I said to begin with, felt that perhaps there was a better way and they were going to produce organic milk uh, and they were going to sell it at a premium and that that would be how they would improve profitability on the farm. But, you know, it wasn't just that easy. The, the reality is that, well, a little bit of, do I, do I have many folks in the room with any kind of dairy farming background? <laughs> a few, a few. So bear with me. I'm going to give you just a, a, a tad of sort of dairy economics 101. So the basic, <laughs> the basic measure uh, for a dairy farmer is 100 pounds of milk. That's what they sell. It's called a C weight, 100 weight. And so let's say back in the 80s that that was bringing in 13, 14 dollars for 100 weight. Um, our farmers, you know, kind of looked at it and they said. A sustainable price for us would be, let's say, seventeen fifty. If we could get to seventeen fifty, we'd feel good about what was going on in the farm. And so they had a strategy. Then they went to market, and whenever we sold uh, products organically, we would not sell it for anything less than that seventeen fifty. Now that meant, as the market was developing, there were a lot of times where we weren't selling it organically, and so we'd get the market price and and the farmer would get, at, at the end of the day, a, a blended price. But we really held to this target of $17.50, and then that became you know, the selling point whenever we went to market. It took us almost 10 years to get to that target price, all right? But we did. And um, you know, the market continued to expand, right? This is a growing market, uh, more consumer demand, and that, that premium then started to grow, and, and, and you know, the, the reality is now, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb, I'm not exactly sure, but let's say a conventional farmer right now is getting about uh, $17 a hundred weight. Our farmers are getting 30, wow. all right? So, so it's been, that, that piece of sustainability uh, has been really important to them, um, and it's allowed them to prosper. So that's number one. And then, you know, secondarily, this idea that, that goes right along with it is stability. And I, I think the best way I can explain this is uh, a little bit how I, I talk about it with, with new employees at Organic Valley. So, okay, I got a room of new employees. You all, you all have started with us, and we've had a negotiation. I've hired you all, and I'm going to pay you $50,000 a year. Great. Okay, we're, we're, good, we're good to go. And for the first, I don't know, three or four paychecks, you open your paycheck, you look at it. $50,000, that's what it's working out to. Great, that's the agreement I had with Jerry. And then you get a paycheck and you look at it and you do the math and it's $52,000 on an annualized basis and you have a few thoughts run through your head. Wow, that's awesome, like that. And then you might say, but why? And then maybe you say, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna go in Jerry's office and ask about that. <laughs> and that goes on for a couple of paychecks. And then you get one, you open it up, and it's $47,000 on an annualized basis. A few thoughts go through your head. That's not so cool. That's not what I agreed to at all. And then you might say, why? 
and then you probably are beating a path to my, my door to find out why, right? Um, the reality is because of this sort of voodoo word called commodity, that's what dairy farmers deal with on a regular basis. Today, this month, I got $15. Next month, I got $15.80. And then two months later, I get $14.50. Well, I don't know about you, but that would be pretty hard uh, to, to put your household budget together and you know, go through what you, you know. It's not like my mortgage is, is going to fluctuate like that. It's not like my, my college tuition for my kid is going to fluctuate like that. So our farmer said it's not just the sustainability, it's also stability. It's very hard for us to run a business and to run a household when we don't know from one month to another what we're going to get. And, you know, so that became a huge part of it. And, and the mechanism by which that happens then is, I think, one of the absolute cornerstones to our co-op. And that is our members participate on an annual basis in helping to determine what that stable pay price will be for the next year. And it's management's job to come forward, well, it's management's job to understand where farmers are at at that point. Are our production costs going up? Are they pretty stable? These kinds of things. And uh, ensure that as we're thinking that through, we're taking into account what, what that looks like, what, what our farmers might need. And then the board of directors approves a, a pay plan for the year. And unless we're in you know, very significant uh, financial uh, difficult situation, we hold to that. And so this twin idea of sustainability and st stability is very, very important to our dairy farmers. Now, Margaret, you also asked about, well, okay, so how have we influenced the, the organic dairy world beyond our, our four walls, if you will? A um, couple of things, and you know, we were, we were lucky enough to be pioneers, so we were there at the beginning in a lot of ways. Um, but, and, and, and so as the market grew, our membership grew, and we, we've always had a very significant block of the overall organic milk being produced in the country. And so that power of collectivism has really helped us out a lot. And the other thing I will bring up is we, we are very, very transparent. So a group of farmers that maybe doesn't really want to join our co-op or they're in a region where at that time we're not looking to expand, they might call us up and they might, you know, how do you do this? And in fact, a very live story, with a group of producers in Ohio some years ago, probably 12, 15 years ago, call us up, they're talking to somebody, how do you do your pricing? We explain it. And then, you know, the guy's like, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll send you the, the pay sheets so you get to see them. And then he didn't think about it at all until about two years later, this group got up and running and, you know, somebody's like, oh, new, new competitor, what are they paying? Well, somebody was able to get a hold of their pay document and they had basically taken our name off of it <laughs> and reproduced it and that's what they were doing. So, you know, and, and we were, we, we kind of gave him a call and said, hey, maybe give us a little credit there, but you know, we were okay with that, right? And so I think that transparency, Margaret, so that then the producers themselves have an understanding, oh, over here at Organic Valley, this is what it looks like. Maybe we can expect the same kind of thing. Maybe we should demand the same kind of thing. Interesting, okay. Um, I have some other questions, but I thought I would just ask you guys um, if you have any, I don't know if we have a mic, Leslie, do we have a mic, or do people just have to stand up and yell? <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions you want to ask the panelists? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, my question to Carla, uh, Paul said that there was no delinquency, there no foreclosures in his park. What about when you make any loans to low income individuals at your company? What is the delinquency rate for them? So the delinquency rate has actually decreased over the years for us. Uh, we currently have a delinquency rate of 1.5% and decreasing. Uh, and, and I think that the, the reason is for a number of, number of factors. Uh, the first is that as we started working with low income, modern income uh, individuals and individuals who, who, whose initial relationship with a financial institution was with us, 
We also make sure that all of our staff became certified as community development financial counselors. So there's a lot of sensitivity, um, first, in ensuring that we understand the, the situation and the reality of our members, um, that we are matching members to the appropriate product, and that we're using all of the risk mitigants that we can. Um, case in point, the, the citizenship loan where we're actually partnering with the community-based organization. Somebody else have a way over there? All right, Kevin, just identify yourself. Um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to throw a question to uh, Mike. Mike, please. Oh, need a mic for the camera. I would like to throw a question to Mike. Though if anybody else wants to chime in, uh, welcome that. So um, instead of comparing cooperatives against non-cooperatives, I want to ask about differences among cooperatives. In the rural electric world that I come from, the uh, two things that seem to be have, have been historically dominant conversations are safe, affordable, reliable electricity, which translates to don't talk to me about renewables, and the second part is, why would we possibly want to expand into uh, broadband? That's not our wheelhouse. We were created to be electric providers. What was the secret sauce inside of, the inside of your organization that says, we want to do something different? Was it an iconic, heroic individual leader? Was it a, <laughs> things are so bad? <laughs> You can claim if it's yours. Is it things are so bad we gotta do something? Or is there something about the discovery or rediscovery of culture and the cultural values of your organization? What was, what was the thing that led to the transformation of your cooperative that sets you differently from most of your cooperative colleagues? And like I say, if anybody else wants to speak to that, welcome that to you. Good question. Uh, well, there's, a, there's a saying you know, among electric cooperatives which is, if you've met one electric cooperative, if you've met one electric cooperative, they're all different, right? They're, none are the same. Um, the, the secret sauce, I guess, at our co-op was a, was a, it took a while. I mean, it took me five years to get the board to approve going forward with the broadband project because, you know, there are a bunch of conservative rural folks that don't like to spend a lot of money and, and I was asking them to double the balance sheet. So that really freaked them out at first. But what, what I think what ended up getting them over the hurdle was a realization after lots and lots of conversations and studies to show them that this is a solid business case, was that we are the only last hope for our community with regards to broadband. It, the investor-owned uh, companies like CenturyLink and Comcast and Verizon, they're not going to come save this territory. There's only six customers per line mile. They're just not going to invest in this area. I mean, if, if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. And, and then harken that back to our origin story, our original mission, which is to provide service to our members and, and meet their unserved needs. We, we worked through a vision, a new vision and values statement that helped them realize that our mission and our vision is to improve the quality of life in the community and we developed six core values around that vision. I think all of that work coming together kind of at the same time would help, would help them realize that, that change their mindset that we're not just, because I've heard that before, you know, this isn't our core business. We're, you know, we're an electric, electric utility. Well, you know, if you aren't innovating, you're gonna die. And I helped show them that, you know, if Bark does not expand into these other areas and see this as a bigger picture and that electric good is just one service of many that we need to be providing our members, we are gonna, we're, we're, the community is not gonna sustain itself long term. And that, all of that work together helped get them over the hump. Yeah, please, Kyla. Yeah, please. So, in, in the credit union system, um, there are nearly 6,000 credit unions all over the United States, and I would say that uh, all of them um, clearly are very invested and focused on serving their members. Um, but what happens beyond that? There are some credit unions, or there's a, a segment of those credit unions within the the bigger universe that are community development financial institutions, they're community development credit unions. And their mission truly is a financial inclusion. Their mission is to go beyond the walls of, you know, the, the membership and really focus on community and what, uh, what contributions can you make to the, to the betterment, the, 
building a resilience of that, of that community. And I would say that um, there are, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a network, and, uh, and I'm happy that Kathy Mann is here from Inclusive, which is the Federation of Community Development Credit Unions, because it is aggregators such as Inclusive that then empower these particular credit unions, this segment of the credit unions, to do more. Um, by injecting capital, by ensuring that there's capacity building, by ensuring that there are ways in which these credit unions can collaborate in deploying loans and so forth. Um, and I say this because more recently, one of the things that we have been looking at is, well, how do these credit unions that focus and have a mission of community development, financial inclusion, how do they perform vis-a-vis -vis the greater credit union community? And more and more we find that those credit unions are actually more successful in terms of growth, in terms of deployment of loans, in terms of capital and return on assets. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a difference, and I'm, I think that sort of the, the soft element of it is also contagion, because you develop this network of, of peers, and everybody's influencing and, and motivating one another. And so I would say that leadership also has a very, is also a very key differentiator on you know, what, makes, what makes a certain sector or segment of your cooperative system to be a little bit different or act a little bit different. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just identify yourself and you want to talk to. Uh, yes, my name is Terrence Courtney. I'm with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And uh, first, I, I'd like to give thanks for this conversation. It's, it's fascinating to me and it, it makes me wonder about this question of the cooperative difference <coughs> But from a macroeconomic perspective, where you know over the last 40 plus years we've seen this trajectory of shrinking social or public services contrasted with expansion of a private sector that to some extent is generating uh, inequality. And each of you have shared case studies where uh, you know it seems to be providing kind of a counter to that trajectory. You know, you're in the financialization uh, where in many communities we see predatory lending, we see a need for more uh, cooperative housing and electricity and rural, and even, you know, with your example of uh, living wage jobs, 15 an hour and plus. So from your perspective, you know, how would you uh, try to provide an analysis for the cooperative the cooperative difference in terms of providing a counter to this historic trajectory we've been on. So, Does somebody want to take that? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, I think you're right on. And, and I think what we're seeing, right, is less emphasis on government support and sort of this mythic idea that, you know, somehow the private sector will step in. And of course, like you're saying, for 40 years it's not happening. Co-ops are the only hope in business to do that as far as I'm concerned. And why is that? Because we don't measure success simply by return to shareholders bottom line. I've heard a couple of the folks up here talk about it. We measure success by the impact we have on our members and the communities that they live in. And so for me, you know, I'm talking about what we're doing to maximize the, the uh, value of the milk for my members. But I also know if I'm not paying my employees a livable wage, you know, how can I do it for one half of the, of the organization but not for the other? Or, you know, the, living in, in rural communities, and, and great story, and, and we have a, a, a rural electric that has done some of the similar things, you know, with some community supported uh, programs for, for solar. In fact, they changed their name to Vernon Communications from Vernon Electric because they're doing the broadband as well. And it's the same thing. I have people that are like, hey, we like broadband. We really would. And, and yeah, the, the publicly owned companies say, yeah, that's not profitable. Sorry for you. Whereas, you know, his, his rural electric's looking at that as a, as a need for the members in their communities. So I, I think, you know, and, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say is, and I think we have to, as a cooperative community, continue relentlessly to tell that story. I'm going to give Brett the last 
word or the last question. Um, Can I say one thing to that? Oh, yeah, I was yeah, going to just sorry. say, you know, we talk internally all the time about how cooperatives are really well positioned with millennials to, to tell our story to millennials who are suspect of large for-profit companies. And they love the message that we're not for profit, we're community based, we're about serving our members. Um, and we're trying to work on marketing around that to, to, the, to a new generation that um, I think that our message really will resonate with. Yeah. And I think a lot of these concepts that you're hearing can be told convincingly as stories. And there's also some metrics that you can put behind them. You can show your penetration rate of internet access relative to before you took this on or relative to another community that doesn't have it. So it doesn't have to be a big and long drawn out study. Sometimes it's just tracking units served or basic access penetration rates. Um, but I think there's convincing uh, numbers that uh, and stories that can be woven together to get at exactly that. So the question that I wanted to do a rapid fire down the row with to wrap <laughs> it up is, uh, I'm getting calls, I'm sure other people in this room are getting calls from uh, you know, would-be presidential candidates. Um, and uh, there's also state and local government always that's of interest. And there's something about co-ops that's attracting attention, I would say, in policy circles. Um, and this is partially a self-interested ask because my next <coughs> paper on co-ops is about policy supports. but. I would love for each of you to share just briefly, when you think about uh, you know, going from where you are to 2x or to 3x, and you can think of that in terms of numbers or assets or members, or um, if you're already serving 100% of the people in your county, you could think of it as 2x on impact um, with different types of products and services. What role can policy play? And try to be a little bit specific of you know, when you're getting the call from the staffer, you know, what, what do you need? What can you do to expand your particular co-op and with a broader sense, this sector, uh, to build a more equitable pathways for Americans? All right, Carla, I'll start and I'll be very self really selfish because I'll take it uh, from a personal um, experience. Mm -hmm. and that is that I immigrated to this country uh, 30 some years ago. And so, and I would say that as it relates to our members here in Washington, D.C., immigration reform. So the John Oliver piece concluded with his recommendation of uh, co-op ownership and uh, opportunity to purchase legislation in every state in the country. Um, that would be a very substantial policy fix uh, that would aid uh, homeowners and communities, no question. And two, I would say for agency folks and others in the affordable housing space, simply putting cooperatives and manufactured housing on a level playing field with other affordable housing resources, I mean, it is absolutely astounding how manufactured housing is written out of, uh, forgotten, ignored, dismissed uh, in virtually every affordable housing program that exists. All right, thank you. Mike. Well, if we're talking solar, I would say I'd like to see the investment tax credit not go away in a couple more years. Um, but if we're talking about um, broadband, you know, it's, it's really just a, it's a big capital build. And the biggest barriers that we have from a policy standpoint is just the amount of regulation that goes along with, with building, building plant, uh, you know, whether it's working with VDOT on their regulations and, and permits that we have to obtain can be very burdensome. Um, and, and or, or it's, if it's e e even easements, if it's private easements, um, just all of that work that goes into the engineering side um, adds dollars to a project, to a, to a build that's very expensive already and to, to a relatively few number of people. All right, Barry. So I guess I'll, I'll talk a little general. I, I think that, um, you know, any, any kind of policy that is putting co-ops on an even footing, that is mentioning co-ops, um, because it simply isn't, doesn't exist in a lot of places. And, and so just that as a baseline of, of where we need to start and building that, as you said, I think, I think that right now there is a, a, a real interest. Okay, so now let's start putting it some small business uh, administration and on down the line and just that, that overall recognition that this is a very <coughs> viable and vibrant business form. All right, 
that's a great way to end. I just want to thank all four of the panelists. Can we just give a <laughs>